Hello, my name is Paul Riley. I'm from the scientific marketing team at Diagnostic Stago, and I would like to introduce the Stago scientific short series on lupus anticoagulant testing with our special guest, uh, Claudia. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Claudia? Sure, thanks, Paul. Um, thanks for having me, by the way. My name is Claudia Escobar. I am the lead uh, applications and new technologies trainer at Diagnostic Estago, uh, but do have uh, an extensive laboratory background with uh, special coagulation as the focus, both adult and pediatric, with lots of lupus anticoagulant testing thrown in. Okay, great. Yeah, so that's what we're trying to zero in on here today and discuss lupus anticoagulant testing, just break down all the different parts of that testing panel because it's a pretty complex set of tests, lots of tests that could be done, different procedures, different methodologies. So let's go right into it. Uh, so with lupus anticoagulant testing, you know, there's the activated partial thromboplastin time test. That's one of the main pillars of that testing panel. Could you briefly explain for us how the activated partial thromboplastin time or the APTT test works and how it, you uh, utilize it in clinical lab screening procedures? Sure, Paul, and you're absolutely right. It is lupus anticoagulant testing is a mishmash of all kinds of different things. So starting right from the basics with the APT testing pathway, um, it's really it's the second most common assay that's performed in all coagulation labs, and it screens uh, intran the intrinsic coagulation pathway. That's really the primary uh, part of the coagulation cascade that it's involved with as far as testing is concerned. It is a global assay, so it's not specific for any one diagnostic as a diagnostic tool for any one disorder. And its three main functions are really for screening intrinsic factor abnormalities, like I mentioned before, and those include factor eight, factor nine, factor 11 and 12, detecting circulating inhibitors, such as lupus anticoagulant that we're gonna talk about today, and it's a non-specific assay if you are monitoring heparin and not using the anti-10A. I see. Okay, so you talked about lupus anticoagulant. How does that affect the APTT? So lupus anticoagulant or LA, we'll use the two terms interchangeably during this session. It's an antibody that targets phospholipids. APTT reagents in and of themselves are mostly composed of phospholipids. So right. if a patient has a lupus anticoagulant or LA, their antibody, which sort of ends up being this Velcro reaction, is going to run around looking for something that is a phospholipid. If you're doing an APTT test, that antibody is going to attach itself to the phospholipids in the APTT reagent and affect the performance and function of those reagents. Okay, so then how does the APTT assay work in the context of the antiphospholipid syndrome diagnostic pathway? So because it has a direct effect on APTT testing, um, the APTT assay becomes a great screening tool as a first step so that if a patient has a suspected lupus anticoagulant or LA, more likely than not, they're going to have a prolonged APTT, which then will trigger additional testing beyond that. Okay, in order to zero in to the antiphospholipid syndrome eventually, perhaps. Absolutely, correct. So it okay. just opens up a pathway of additional testing that is done in the laboratory. Okay, sure. So the phospholipid level in the assay, that sounds like a really important uh, aspect to discuss. How does that phospholipid level relate to LA screening and diagnosis? So it goes really back to that LA, to the LA impact on APTT testing. So as a phospholipid antibody, LA is going to target, as I mentioned before, the phospholipids that are floating around in those APTT reagents and really latch onto them. Depending on the strength of a patient's lupus anticoagulant will be the impact of their antibody on the performance of the APTT reagent used in the laboratory. So mm -hmm. you can see anywhere from a mild to a really significant prolongation in their clotting time, again, depending on how strong that antibody is in a patient sample. So here's an analogy that I use. 
and think of it as musical chairs. So say you only have four chairs in this game of musical chairs, and those are the phospholipids in an APTT reagent. The people mm -hmm. running around trying to get access to those chairs and sit down are the antibodies, the phospholipid antibodies that are in a patient sample. So as you're testing using that APTT reagent, the fewer chairs you have, the more impact that lupus anticoagulant antibody is going to have on a, on a clotting time. So, and vice versa, if you have a bunch of chairs, meaning a high phospholipid content in your reagent, yeah. in your PTT reagent, and again, you have those folks running around trying to get a butt in a chair, then <laughs> that's where you're going to see the equalizing or normalization of a clotting time when you're running lupus testing with PTT based assays. Okay, then. Yeah, we don't want to be left without a chair for playing musical chairs. Yeah. So that's a really good analogy that I think we can all relate to. Great. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to sign off from this podcast for now, now that we've addressed the basics of the APTT test. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Paul. Not a problem. Anytime.